only innovate our technology, not our company. That's what a colleague told me. Not at Red Hat. I'm from Red Hat. I'm in Brian's team, actually. Um, and we only innovate our technology in another company. It was a very fun conversation I had about technology in general when we tried to change things. And it's always about the technology, as if technology changes everything. Um, so yeah, I, this talk is Hack Day's Profit. Just because this didn't make for such a good talk title, yet another way to tell you that stuff depends on other stuff, and you're the one who knows best, because that's what data is about. But instead, we called it Hack Day's Profit. Um, so here are some numbers and facts you can use to actually make profit or, or make data work for you. But keep in mind that I didn't have any really accurate numbers, so I just made up most of them. Because um, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. It does work. It works exactly like that. So just as a little background, I've worked in engineering for years before I now work as a community manager at Red Hat. So I do have some actual numbers to back up the stuff. It's just that, yeah, they are sort of also made up. Um, there are three types of metrics. Metrics, DEM metrics, and KPIs. Everyone knows KPIs are key performance indicators. So, and if not, you just know it now. Um, I've got this book with me. If you want to take a look at it, Brian's going to get it afterwards. It's The Tyranny of Metrics, and it's really, really good. Mostly it explains about, yeah, sure, metri metrics are great, but you really have to know what you're using them for. Here's a little excerpt. Um, the author writes about how metrics are used wrong in medicine and in, in crime fighting and in education. So here's a really good example. When surgeons are rated or remunerated according to their success rates, some respond by refusing to operate on patients with more complex or critical conditions. It goes on that then people die because they're not being operated on, but those deaths do not show up in the metrics because they've never been operated on. So a surgeon can be super successful with 100% survival rate, but he's just only ever going to do like really tiny stuff like nose operations or whatever because he doesn't want to do the hard stuff. That's the problem with metrics. And uh, in the book he also goes on telling about how in education uh, teachers would just fake results of students in order to improve their own success rate, stuff like that. So this is what we have to look out for. Types of jobs that rely heavily on metrics because they don't produce anything are community management, developer relations and marketing. And these are all kind of related. And since we don't really produce stuff, we have to make up KPIs. So what are we going to measure ourselves on? <clears throat> OK, so what kind of metrics are we talking? So there's KPIs, key performance indicators. Those are metrics you track and report to your boss after hoping they work out in your favor. Then we have predictive metrics, metrics you track because you think a change will warn you of something. Like your contributor base is going down, might be because your community is unhealthy, or because of other stuff, so you're, you're going to track those. Then you have regret metrics, metrics you track to avoid repeating a problem you had in the past, which is, for example, diversity and inclusion, or maybe something else that's specific to your project. And then we have campaign metrics, metrics you track to see whether something you have initiated is useful and successful. You have, like, a lot of companies will have Google Analytics and then a special campaign on it, which they will track. We also have procrastinated metrics. This is what we had uh, in our teams, like metrics you have because the data seems like it ought to be important, but you really have no use for them. So it says maybe demographics, maybe such as contributor data, if you're not actually making use of any of this, then it's not going to be useful for you. Uh, community health metrics, like any other data, are all about interpretation and what you make of them. By the way, I'm talking really fast, so that leaves a lot of questions. A lot of time for questions later. This is a great XKCD one. I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class, now I don't. Sounds like the class helps, well maybe. <laughs> so that's, that's what we have with data. Now, this one we can spend a little more time on. Um, it's the actual metrics that are used. So I worked for a recruiting company as a business analyst. I worked for, I worked as a developer. Um, now I worked as a community manager and I also worked in marketing and developer relations. So these are, these are actual KPIs that were used when I worked at these, in these departments. For HR, you have applications, interviews and rejections. 
those are the most used metrics. What you could also use, and some companies do use, are satisfaction survey results. So how, how satisfied were you with your recruitment process? And a lot of people, even if they received a no, if they've had a really pleasant process, they will maybe apply again, but they will mostly answer positively to your survey results. So these would be important, and also successful starts, whether they stayed and stuff. That's data you can actually use that also makes sense. That is not just about tracking your recruiters and seeing, oh, this is employee of the month because she had 20 interviews instead of 18 like the other person. So those are metrics that would be useful, for example. In marketing, we have all kinds of metrics. We have social media followers, social media interaction, impressions, CPC, CPA, CDR, like click-through ratio for every link on the website. We have clicks per, like cost per click. We have uh, CPA's um, cost per acquisition. So I worked in a company where they have calculated exactly how much money they can spend on a new customer before it becomes unreasonable. So in that case, it was 400 euros. So if they spend less than 400 euros on a new customer, then it's a win. Uh, I don't know exactly how that was calculated, but it was interesting because that's how they calculated whether they're going to sponsor this or that conference, um, whether they're going to sponsor this or that ad, whether they're going to do Red Monk, whether they're going to do D-Zone, whether they're going to do any sponsored articles. It was all about how the conversion worked out to new customers. That was very interesting. Um, and what that could also be is for marketing, I think most important is funnel conversion. So how much money do you spend, how much trickles down to registrations, for example, for a product, and how much then do actual users who pay. So that's the cost per new acquisition. For community, what we use, or some of us use, everyone has different types of ways to measure their community health, which is good because every project is different, as we've seen with OpenShift versus other projects. Um, so we have, of course, social media and how much interaction there is, forums, new and continuous contributors, interaction on the various communication media, um, and content forwarded by the community. So not just content created, but mostly also which content gets out and which doesn't. That's a very important metric for, for at least my project. Um, for, for what it could also be is sentiment analysis. We've talked a little bit about that. And it's basically about how aggressive word, like how aggressive is the wording, what are the basic emotions, and we can use NLP for that, and really good data science project. Do you want to say something? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and comparative competitor analysis is really, really good for community projects. Uh, comparative competitor analysis is when you check other projects and you compare them equally. So there are different tools that you can use. You type in all the competitor names, and then it gives you an exact analysis of how many interactions on Twitter does this one have, how many different ways on the internet does it have. It's very, very nice to see, especially with open source projects, which ones generate. And there's always projects that generate more here and more there and more on Twitter. Some are on Mastodon, some are just on Facebook, stuff like that. Um, so comparative competitor analysis, analysis is really good. For developer relations, most of developer relations departments really just use how many conferences were we at and how much content did we push out. And sometimes the quality doesn't matter. It's just about showing to your boss, I went to 10 conferences in the last half year and I put out 12 blog articles, so I deserve the bonus more than the person who did eight, even though they were better. Um, this is a problem a little bit with developer relations. Whereas a cost, yeah. Whereas a customer survey of their acquisition journey, so for example, if a customer meets the developer advocate at a conference and then they become a customer due to that, that would be a good data point. But usually you don't get to those. And it's, it's hard to track these things. Um, for development, it's very easy. It's like usually you have box fizz, ticket solved, how much time something took to so fix and how much, like what the bug rate is. Do we have 60% bugs or just five in, in six months, build times, everything like that. What we could also measure for development is how much overtime has not been had. Has it have people consistently work just uh, 40 hours or has it been a consistent 60 hour work week for everyone? This is an important metric. That also shows a lot about how much people are gonna quit later on, so it's also important for HR. For product, we have features implemented and customer issues resolved, like people request a feature, and then they get it, yay, product gets one of their metrics up, one up. 
technical debt cleared should be a metric in product, but it's not most of the time. For customer service, it's very easy. We had tickets solved and time, time to solve. What we could also do is continuous customer survey results, like some companies do, which is really good. For the costs, so I've, I've not written down the cost for development and product because that's just usually salaries. Whereas for these four, it's a little in, more interesting other than salaries. For HR, an external recruiter you, re, you take to hire usually takes about three gross salaries of the person they're hiring. So if they're hiring, let's say, a developer, the developer earns 5,000 euro per month uh, gross, so the, the recruiter will get a payment of 15,000. And that's how much a recruiter costs. So these are the costs, for example. Um, whereas if you're hiring or if you're finding someone at a conference that you pay, to, let's say you pay for a booth at a small conference, you pay 7,000 euro. And you get two people who are interested in company and they apply, then you have basically saved half of what you've had for just one position for a recruiter. So that, in that sense, Sometimes you have HR booths at conferences because it makes sense for them because the booth is still cheaper than having an external recruiter. For marketing, mid-level specialists for anything, whether it's search engine optimization or uh, technical writers who are going to do some deep technical documentation, uh, that's about 80 to 150. It really depends. Some are much more than that. Um, and some mid-level is about around 80 to 150 euro per, per hour for their work. Uh, for social media, search engines, there's always different. You have the ads and you'll just have to inquire how much it's gonna cost you. And here, the difference between the cost per acquisition and the cost of what it actually took you to acquire, that's the one, that's the metric that you should look out for. If you, for example, consistently spend 200 less than the maximum, then you're good. You're good at acquiring customers. For community, the costs are swag, travel, and infrastructure. Because you have forums to, to, do, to maintain, you have servers, you have websites. That's all stuff that's usually on the community side, and all that stuff costs. For developer relations, it's travel equipment for testing stuff, for finding out new stuff, for programming new, new things, and paid content. Because often developer relations also outsource things, so they'll pay 500 euro for a person to write new content. Um, which is usually not as good as if the person who's consistently in it writes it. So, um, most importantly, working on open source is a real privilege. People in, like, we're all kind of in the area and we don't realize in the last years when I worked as a developer, it's hard to work on open source. Mostly it's forbidden in your contract, but also it's just really, really hard to get the time to work on open source. And when you get home, sometimes you just don't want to. So we, we can talk all about we want as metrics and stuff like that, but I've talked to a lot of people who are not even allowed to travel to a conference. They have to take vacation time just to travel to a conference to attend it. But giving a talk is something that they, they would not even think of. If they think of it, their boss blocks it. So this is more of a talk to explain some costs to them because sometimes people are not aware of how things work in terms of costs. Um, and if you can... Go to your boss and say, okay, I know we're paying, this is where good connections also to the other departments come in at the coffee table and other stuff. So if you know that your department just paid 35,000 euro for that one booth at the 5,000 people conference, you can say, look, but my travel costs just 500 euro. Let me go there and I'll give you two people that I, meet, I will meet there. You can basically have it as your own goal to Make sure that you network with at least three people who are relevant to your business. And then if you do a report on that, and if you just include some metrics, your boss will likely be impressed even if it's made up. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Yes? Hold on. <laughs> I shouldn't have done this talk with colleagues actually present. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Yeah, I noticed the, I love the talk. It was really Thank you. a great overview of how we can all be a little bit better at, at factoring in metrics and money into our value. Um, one question on the DevRel side, yeah. the developer relations, you had really marketing-centric uh, metrics, yeah. where like Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, well, Amazon's a little different, but they're primarily uh, sitting in between product and marketing. Yes. And their KPIs Yes. So are you seeing uh, more of a leaning towards marketing for DevRel or the other way? Or? 
it's so at Red Hat we have different DevRel for and and every manager has different KPIs they measure their employees on. When I worked in developer relations before Red Hat, it's a lot marketing focused because people don't quite get the difference, and usually they think you're marketing. Um, the developers sometimes think the same. So yeah, it's it's really dependent on the manager. Yeah. Any more? Yes? Do you have any good uh, not deliberately using uh, the word good uh, way of distinguishing metrics that are for useful for you and your team and telling you uh, what you should do or how you're doing versus metrics and, and reports that will to satisfy your boss? In our case, like my boss is really good. And she doesn't, she doesn't look at metrics the same way as, for example, it happened to me in other companies. So for my projects right now, all I care about is how happy people are. And that I'll notice via the forums and via the um, Twitter interaction. People are very friendly to each other and there's constantly a flow of, this community is great. And as long as this keeps up, I'm happy. And my boss is happy as well. Because those are the metrics I focus on. I'll show her, look, like these people said that, and that's great. If I just come up with new contributors, I'm like, yeah, so this week we had one new contributor and they fixed a typo on the website. It's not a very impressive metric. It's nice, but it doesn't show anything about community help, about how it's going, whether people like it, 